Okay, so I think that's most people logged on. Um, welcome to today's webinar on Are You Ready for IR35? Brought, brought to you by Oliver James. Um, unfortunately, Charlotte has been unable to join us um, today, so Kay Skinner will be stepping in um, as one of our speakers. Um, Kay is our Senior People and Performance Consultant, performing part of our global L&D team. Kay is also part of our IR35 project and runs all of Oliver James' internal IR35 training, as well as helping to host our external IR35 roundtable series so she's, she's a great addition to today. Our second presenter John Bleasdell is OJ's Client Relations Associate Director. John forms part of the IR35 project team and has worked in recruitment for over 16 years. He has extensive experience in contract recruitment working with both clients um, as well as candidates um, and whilst also leading on our IR35 roundtable series. I'm Stephanie Teese and today I'm joined by Matt Gale and we'll be hosting and facilitating this webinar. So today we'll be discussing some of the key takeaways from our recent IR35 roundtable series with C-suite and HR leaders from leading businesses within the UK. Discussion will focus upon the impact of IR35 on the market so far, some of the key challenges of IR35 determinations, considerations of inside versus outside determinations, the CES tool, how to deliver a compliant IR35 project and the project solutions available, as well as the impact of IR35 on the availability of skills and talent. At the end of the session, we'll be hosting an allocated Q&A. Um, this may run slightly over the schedule, depending on, depending on how many questions we get. Um, how, so if you feel the need, if you need to be um, to drop off, uh, please do so. However, if you would like to get involved, please feel free to submit your questions through the live chat tool as we work through the webinar. You can also use the tap, uh, chat tool to tell us about any technical problems you may experience during the session. For now, let's begin our webinar. John, what is the general feeling around IR35 within the market? Introduction. Um, so um, we have run a series of, of roundtables, as Steph has mentioned, and we were trying to gauge the feeling initially around um, what people were feeling around IR35, where their projects were up to and what they were doing internally. Our feeling at Oliver James was that it perhaps wasn't getting the same amount of visibility and traction um, that it got last year. And uh, we were keen to sort of uh, get a sense check from the market uh, as to what that looked like. So what we found out was actually um, what we believe to be true in some respects. This year has been extremely turbulent for many of our clients. It's been a challenging year. And because all of our clients went through this IR35 journey last year, they haven't sort of kicked off um, with as much momentum um, as they did last year. So last year, we were talking to clients about determinations as early as October. Um, but this time around, not many of our clients are really sort of gearing up to do determinations now until January. So we're going to be starting later this year. Um, we feel that, um, you know, most companies who made a decision around what to do with IR35 last year, sort of going into April 2020, have predominantly stuck with uh, with what their plan is going to be. So uh, if they decided not to engage with PSCs, they're generally sticking with that. If they decided to assess individually, they seem to be sticking with that. So we haven't seen too many uh, changes um, and we're expecting largely that companies are gonna roll out the same program as they did yeah, last year. But I think in summary for this question, um, IR35 certainly hasn't gained as much impact and as much um, traction this time around uh, as early, but I expect that to pick up in, in January. Um, Kay, do you have anything to add on that subject? Yeah, so I think, um, as John said, I think there was a lot of nervousness um, last year. I think clients generally from the, the feedback we've had on roundtables feel more confident. They feel like they've got more knowledge. Um, but I would say that the hesitations and where the questions were generally focused were towards how the assessment should be done, um, what assessment should look like, what the minimum expectations are. Um, and, you know, although they feel more knowledgeable, um, there's still lots of nervousness and concerns about um, how they actually put determinations together. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot of what came out of the, the, the roundtables. OK, so th thanks for that, uh, both of you. It's Matt here. Um, so just um, looking at it to date, what impact has IR35 had on the markets thus far? So building up towards um, April 2020 last year, we expected that there would be a significant decline in the number of limited company contractors 
we actually anticipated a decline in contract numbers in general. And we were getting that feedback from our clients that whilst they were going through their IL35 programs, one of their motivations were to actually drop the number of contractors that they had. Um, so we expected a, a drop in contractor numbers and we expected it to be a quieter year for contract this year. Um, pleased to say actually that has not been the case. So we actually found that there is a significant um, sort of uh, maintenance of contractor numbers post April, um, which I guess could be expected. We've got a lot of extensions through um, for contractors that may have come to an end um, in April 2020. And uh, what we also sort of thought would be the case, is that there'd be a, a decline in the number of contract vacancies that we would have this year. So for example, um, we thought we'd have less vacancies, we thought our contractor numbers would decline, and ultimately we thought our number of limited company contracts would decline. I think versus a standard year, our limited company contractors have gone down, but our number of vacancies has actually gone um, very well this year. So even to the extent we've had two record breaking contract months in what has been a turbulent year because of COVID and obviously a challenging year with everything that's been for IR35. So yeah, um, not had the impact that we thought it would have. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what that impact would have been without COVID. And it'd be interesting to see what the impact would have been had IR35 come in last year as planned. But uh, we can only uh, assess on what has happened. And yet our, our clients are still very much utilizing uh, PSC resource and contract resource. And, and that doesn't um, seem to show any signs of slowing at the moment. Um, I think the, the one thing impact it has had is there are some companies who have decided not to engage with limited company contractors. And those, con those companies are, um, when they're coming to recruit, finally they've got a decreased talent pool to choose from. So uh, companies who are unwilling to engage with PSCs are finding they're going to have to pay more money um, for a reduced talent pool. Still very good people who are, are, are comfortable working on a PAYE basis, but if you're not assessing the roles individually, you're always going to have less people to look at. Um, and those have been the main impacts uh, on the market so far. Okay. Yeah, I think just to, to follow on from that, I think on the basis that clients now feel more educated, they feel like they're in a better position, um, really understand what inside of IR35 means. Um, they've been able to be a bit more creative with the solutions. Um, so things like John said about reviewing budgets, being a bit more flexible with rates, um, understanding their umbrella partners or their accountancy firm partners. Um, there's been a bit more creativity there. Um, I think an interesting point that came from the roundtable and, and a sort of consensus was that IR35 will not be postponed again. Um, obviously, everyone has a million things going on with the impact of the pandemic, but the consensus and, and sort of the the um, what we're hearing in the market is that the consensus overall is that it won't be postponed again. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going to be very relevant going into next year. Great, thanks Kay. Um, so what are some of the key challenges when it comes to IR35 determinations? Was there anything that came out um, from the Roundtable series in particular? Um, it's probably one of the most detailed uh, questions that we um, we received and that sort of provoked quite a lot of um, discussion. And I, I think actually with IR35, this is the thing that you know, really causes all the uh, the challenges, the debate, uh, the frustration is all around how do you make a determination, and every every company is challenging it in a slightly uh, in a slightly different way. So the number one um, sort of word I use when we're talking about IR thirty five determination, this came across in all of the roundtables, is interpretation. Um, a lot of the questions um, that are asked when making a determination are open to some degree of uh, interpretation. So if we take the CEST tool, for example, um, the questions on there are, are quite challenging. Um, managers, um, you know, HR, uh, talent, they've never had to answer these kind of questions before. And we're talking about some very technical aspects of how a limited company um, functions, how a contractor um, works on site within a business so when we're looking at these types of questions it, it's sort of it's very difficult then to have a a real sort of ubiquitous um determination for anybody um when when you're looking at a, assessing a contractor so what were the main questions that, that that come up what are the main challenges so the first one is um for me is around substitution um substitution was 
you know, always seen as a bit of a silver bullet for being an outside of IR35 contractor. Um, you know, most contracts uh, allow for some form of right of uh, substitution being fettered or unfettered. Um, and for in the early days with the CES tool, if you tick that you would uh, be able to provide a substitute, then more often than not, you probably get an outside determination. Um, there's been quite a lot of case law and quite a lot of discussion on the fact of, you know, maybe your contract says you can provide a substitute, but can you in reality? And that's that's where this uh, real challenge comes in, because most of our contractors and most contractors can provide a substitute, but would the end client accept it? And would they be available to um, to be a substitute should they be um, available to do so? And that's really challenging, right? So it's very difficult to prove that at any point you have a substitute to put in. And the advice that, and this is my own personal advice to, to my clients, is that actually substitution is not enough um, to get an outside determination. And, and whilst it's the easiest way, um, because it's so difficult to prove, as I've discussed, um, we advise that there's a, a much better way to um, to run contracts compliantly outside of IR35, and that sort of focus more on mutuality of obligation and control. The substitution was a huge uh, talking point last year, and I think it will be this year again. Uh, fortunately, um, as you probably know, the CES tool changed in November of last year to allow uh, people to say that they couldn't provide a substitute but still get an outside determination, which I think is more reflective, therefore, of the working practice of the uh, of the contractors themselves. Um, interestingly enough, another thing that um, I don't think was reviewed enough last year, and, and I am sort of very much pushing this year, is actually the emphasis on the contracts themselves. So whilst working practice is extremely important, mutuality obligation is extremely important, what's actually written in the contract itself, I think, is is equally important to those things. So, you know, does the contract have a clear set of defined deliverables? Um, that the contractor is working towards or, or does it not? Um, you know, is it reflective of a permanent contract or does it actually, you know, read and look like a, a true consulting contract? And, you know, we spent a lot of time last year tweaking our contracts to really reflect what was going on in reality. And that's a, a phrase that you may hear quite a lot is, is reflecting what's going on in reality. And there are best practice um, things for contracts uh, that you can utilize when talking about um, you know, reflecting reality within the contract. So, you know, contract really, in, in best practice terms, shouldn't run longer than three months without being refreshed. Um, deliverables changed, updated. You know, this is a, a business to business contract agreement and therefore should reflect that. And when things are completed, they should be removed. And when things are, um, you know, being uh, extended or need to be changed, then they are updated. So that at any point, the, uh, the contract truly does reflect what the contractor is doing on the site. Um, the issues around determination and control. So, you know, is the contractor acting uh, like a contractor? You know, are they, um, you know, being seen as a true consultant working, you know, either on a project or to a set piece of uh, to set deliverables? You know, are these things all uh, being maintained? Are they being managed? Are they managing people? There's a whole raft of questions that need to be asked when we're talking about making a determination, um, a termination with a client and a candidate. And that's sort of something else that needs to be considered, both the candidate and the uh, the manager, whoever that might be, whether it's the person signing the timesheet off, whether it be um, HR, they need to be working together to complete the CES tool or any assessment tool. It doesn't necessarily have to be the CES, of course, but they need to work together because there's a number of factors that go on to making a, um, an assessment um, that you won't know unless you have um, the upper and level, upper and uh, excuse me, upper and lower level contracts, you have the feedback from the manager and you have the feedback um, from the contractor themselves. And unless you put all that picture together, you can't get a true determination. So I've touched on loads of different things there. Happy to answer any questions around that. But um, yeah, um, those are some of the main challenges that were discussed during the roundtables. Yeah, so I think um, uh, secondary to, to some of the discussion that we had around uh, determinations on the roundtables, the businesses, the higher managers, you know, the, the recruitment HR teams that felt that they were furthest on in the pro projects was where there was a really clear um, defined project structure internally within those businesses. So businesses where they had a go-to person for IR35, everyone in the business understands and knows where the business is heading. Um, and if there are any queries or questions or, you know, determinations that need to be put together, people internally know who to go to. So the businesses that felt they were in the best position had really good communication, both internally, 
externally there was an understanding of key time scales um, and interestingly those those key time scales as, as John mentioned at the beginning were probably now um, and we're not necessarily seeing that happening yet so it will be interesting to see when businesses start to put communications out you know which businesses get ahead of the curve and have that consistent go-to person in the business that understands the the implications and the determinations and can offer um support and um advice um it re again it really you know came out of the round table so that everyone still has challenges different challenges for people in in contract positions people uh, you know who are, are hiring managers um there still appears to be some lack of trust around the cess tool there's still blanket determinations and i think the big um sort of word that came out of a lot of the discussions was fairness you know what is fair how do we make it fair across the the market and um you know what tools are best to use which i think um we'll probably discuss a little bit later as well Thanks a lot for that, Kane. Thanks again, John. Uh, before we move on to the next part, I just wanted to make it clear to everyone um, listening in, if you have any questions at all, if, there's a, if you've got anything that you'd like either Kay or John um, to answer or to run through, please use the, um, the messaging um, feature on the webinar and we'll be happy to, um, to run through anything that we can today. Um, other than that, um, John Kay, um, again, before we move on to the next part, is there anything else that um, needs to be considered when making inside or outside determinations that hasn't been covered um, in what you've just discussed. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I think the um, when you're making a determination, uh, you need to consider um, so many things that, that we've discussed earlier in terms of the CESTOR questions, but sometimes it's very, um, I, I find it very useful just to actually look at some things quite um, on quite a basic level. So for example, you know, um, if you think about how a permanent member of staff operates versus how you believe a, a consultant or a contractor should work, you know, there should be some real key uh, differences there in how these people are operating. So, you know, if you are a contractor on site, are you really, um, you know, a true contractor? You know, do you work to a set of predefined criteria that you are therefore working through? Or are you someone who um, is really directed by the client? And this is really important it's, for me it's, the, it's one of the biggest things uh, around making a determination um, because I think that a lot of contracts historically have been signed up for a, a six-month project it may well have had clear deliverables at the start um, and, and been an outside assignment um, but over time these lines start to get a little blurred you, you know contractor stays a little bit longer maybe they're getting upwards to a, a year 18 months um, no one's looked at their uh, outputs um, but this person has suddenly become um, very important to the organization and then over a period of time you have someone whose lines between being a, a permanent member of staff and being a true contractor working outside of IR35 starts to get starts to get a little blurred so this is what goes back to my point earlier about making sure that the contract reflects reality and the need to refresh these contracts continually uh, yes it's a little bit of a headache from an administration perspective but actually this really ensures that you're running a compliant outside of IR35 contract so it's really really important and, and basic questions that you can ask is things like you know uh, what is the purpose of the role if you can answer that easily that's a good sign you know is it predefined and predetermined as in these are the things we need to achieve and this is the outcome and this is your part in that or are these things something that's a bit more fluid that you know um, you are actually dictated to or you're told what your part of the project is on a, on a weekly basis you might not know what you're going to be doing next month and I think if that's the case it starts to do, it starts to suggest to me that actually you're in a little bit of control from the client and starts to lean towards an inside IR35 assignment these are all things that you know um, can't be taken on their um, on their own individual merits. You've got to look at the complete picture, the contracts, um, ass assessment tools from a, a, a client and a, and a contractor perspective. But these are things that start to indicate whether the assignment is in or outside of IR35. Other things are, you know, uh, do you sign off timesheets? I spoke to a number of contractors and had some in our webinars, uh, in our roundtables, interestingly enough, who, who signed off contractors, uh, other, other contractors' timesheets. And if you're signing off, uh, contract timesheets that's a real indication that you have quite a lot of authority to sign off company money and that's something really only a permanent member of staff should have so these are again little tests that you can do to say okay maybe I might be falling more inside and these things can be fixed right these aren't things that can't be changed if you uh, adjust your working practices you can very much get to a place where you might be um, working more outside than inside but you need to be very 
uh, very carefully don't fall uh, one way or the other depending on what you know the way that you're working another thing that we um we also need to consider now is the impact of covid on making an outside or inside determination so um last year um or I say April 2020 it feels like last year um it's been a long time um but um a lot of companies felt their contractors worked inside of IR35 because they needed to be on site, because they needed to be in the office nine to five. Um, but actually that's all changed now. Um, you know, flexible working, remote working has been pushed forward, you know, 10, 15 years from where it was. And now if you run the same assessment for the same contractor doing a similar type of role, um, you may well get a different outcome because they're working from home, they're not on site, um, they're not going to be involved in anything to do with the company, and they really are working as a, a true consultant. So um, any determinations, I believe, that were run uh, and the build-up to April 2020 all have to be redone. We're certainly targeting getting all ours done again um, to make sure that we've got accurate determinations for our contractors. Um, okay, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think um, following on for, from what John said there, the, the the feedback that we received in the roundtables and where people feel that um, uh, things were done properly and well is where there was a collaboration. So where there was a conversation between the contractor, the hiring manager, the the, the business about the working practices, the contract and how everything looked, um, you know, where people felt that there was a miscommunication or, or, or things broke down is where the, the business made determinations without consulting the person actually um, in that position um, and on that contract. So I think collaboration when putting determinations together is, is a key a key thing that, that leads to success. Um, the other sort of misconception that I just want to make clear is um, the legislation doesn't define a contractor as inside or outside you, you as an individual are not an inside or outside contractor it defines the assignment as inside or outside so depending on deliverables depending on what the actual assignment is that is what is being considered not you as an individual um so you know individuals can do a, a inside ir35 assignment and an outside ir35 assignment in their career um, with with no issues as long as everything has been properly determined and considered and, and put together. So I think it's just a, a misconception that, that I want to dispel that, that that came out of the roundtables. Yeah, that's that's really important, Kay. Um, you know, it, it's you've got to be sure that everything is determined on an individual basis on individual individual merits. Um, that's why the HMRC disagrees with blanket determinations. Um, and as a contractor, you can't walk into the sign and say, I am outside of IR35. That's the way I work, um, because it's got to be reflective of the whole piece of the puzzle. Um, as we've said earlier, you want to take everything on an individual basis and determine everything uh, individually to be compliant for IR35 purposes, be it in or outside of IR35. Um, we have had a, a question, um, so I'll just uh, answer that, which is, uh, what is the minimum amount of work experience do you consider would credibly put someone outside of IR35? And so this will reflect a little bit on, on what Kay has just said, but there's nothing about um, the number of years of experience that puts someone in or outside of IR35. Um, so, and that's, um, if someone can have 15, 20 years uh, experience as a consultant, but if they find themselves working in a role, um, that doesn't have predefined deliverables, where they are um, working fluidly, but not to any kind of main criteria. Um, they're finding that you know their time is being dictated to, as in someone is telling them what they need to focus on by a week by week or month by month basis. Um, you're running appraisals for um, permanent members of staff. You may be signing off timesheets. Uh, there's a whole range of criteria that could put you inside, even though um you know you are a um uh you know you might feel that yourself that you're an outside contractor everything has to be determined um you'll sound like a broken record but individually so years of experience doesn't really count um towards an outside determination there is a question on the cess tool which does refer to this which sort of asks something along the lines of you know um specialist um it's a question around are you a specialist and therefore sort of falling outside of ir35 it's not the exact word in the question but that's what it's alluding to and it does it does have some impact on the uh, on the determination but it's not a significant impact so everything else has to be right otherwise the assignment could well still fall inside ir35 Similarly, if you look at the uh, the other end, uh, so the more junior end of the market, uh, people have got one, two years of experience, but want to go contracting, which is you know perfectly possible. Um, it, again, it doesn't matter uh, about the years of experience that puts you in or outside of IR35. I would argue 
um, that if someone is um, uh, not significantly experienced in the role that they're going in to perform, they may need more guidance, they may need more, more help, and therefore they may need more direction um, and support, which may lean towards an inside assignment. But you know, you can't say that uh, in summary for all uh, contracts of a certain level, because you'd have to see what their experience was and what they were going in to do. It could be that even from a, a couple of years experience perspective, they're an expert or suitably qualified from a given area and therefore, uh, you know, can have a perfectly um, compliant outside determination. Um, so I hope that answers the question. And um, as any more comes in, I will I'll answer them as they go. That's great. Thank you, John. Um, so you touched upon the CES tool earlier. Um, what was the general feeling around the CES tool and the roundtables? So the CES tool got um, a lot of flack um, uh, in the run up to April 2020. And uh, some of that was founded and some of it unfounded. Um, most companies seem to be using the CES tool. I think that's the um, the most um, common tool that's used. It's one the HMRC recommends and a common quote that I heard from um, from clients around the round table was, if the HMRC have recommended it, why wouldn't we use it? Um, which, you know, it's, it's tough to argue with. There are some very good products on the market um, for evaluation purposes, um, but they're all, they're all testing on the same criteria, right? They're all testing to see whether um, you are a disguised employee or not. Um, so the questions are similar, uh, even though they're asked in slightly different ways. Um, one of the main sort of criticisms of the CES tool was that it was sort of, I guess, predefined or leaned to giving an inside determination, which I guess you could, you know, expect a little bit from the HMRC. And they did make some um, they did make some adjustments um, at the back end of last year uh, to make it a little bit more user friendly and to allow um, a little bit of a, uh, a less of a lean towards an inside assignment. So it did improve. For me, the biggest thing about the CES tool is the HMRC have said it will stand by it, provided the information that you put in is correct. Now, this came across on all of our roundtables, a big discussion point, because I think some people originally assumed that if you got an outside determination from the CES tool, you were, um, you know, you were in the clear, there was no issues, but um, they're only saying that if you get everything right. So if you've answered a question incorrectly and you may not have meant to, or you may have misinterpreted, which I think goes down to my interpretation point earlier, you may sort of misunderstood or, or, or got the interpretation of the question wrong, uh, you may not put the correct information into the CES tool and therefore you may not get a correct assessment out of the CES tool. So whilst the HMRC has said it will stand by it, um, what it's not said is um, if, it's, if it's an incorrect information in, incorrect information out, and therefore you'll get an incorrect determination. So uh, this is what calls into um, what I think a lot of managers and contractors need is education on how to fill out the CES tool and help and support in understanding what those questions mean. Uh, and that's something that I think um, you know, anybody who uh, spends a lot of time playing with a CES tool or putting in different um, uh, question and answers know that there's only there's a few questions that will set you on one path or another and if you know them it's very easy to get an outside determination so really understanding the questions um, will really help you make sure that you get a compliant answer um, that combined with the fact of course that you must have um, two sets of opinions on that test tool it must be the uh, end client and it must be the contractor themselves to give you an example of that, there's a very key question in the CES tool, which asks about contracts having multiple clients. Now, if you get a CES tool um, a determination and it's just been ran from the client, they may not know uh, that you as a contract have multiple clients. You may do things in the weekend, you know, you may uh, do things in the evening for other clients, which you invoice for, which is you know perfectly uh, reasonable and compliant to do so, uh, but the end client doesn't know. And that may change the way that the determination is run. So this is why there's obviously a good um, process for contesting determinations, but also why you must run these concurrently um, as candidate and contractor, sorry, a client and contractor. Um, so those are some of the, the discussions we had around the CES tool. Um, Kay? Yeah, it's quite an interesting one. Um, the, and this sort of came out the back end of the roundtables after we discussed a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today. Um, a lot of higher managers sort of get to the point where they throw their hands in the air and say, do you know what, I can't deal with the in inverted commas hassle of dealing with all of this. And, you know, how long is this going to take me? And, and, you know, it's an admin burden. Um, the thing to just always be aware of that, that we're always weighing up is, is yes, there is a, a consideration to be taken there. But the the, the flip side of that is the availability of talent 
um, you know, the, the, the availability of limited company contractors, um, the best quality in the market by doing proper determinations, um, as, you know, assigning your assignments properly, um, there is a benefit to it of, of, of being, you know, having availability to the best limited company contract work, workforce. So although it feels like quite a lot of a burden and a hassle and, and an admin, there is a, a, an upshot to doing it effectively and doing it properly. Um, and it's just, you know, I think we, we, we kind of took a lot of time talking that through and, you know, weighing those two things up and, and finding the best solution. So it's just to be aware that, yes, it feels like a time consuming thing, but the long term gain of, of having the right people in the right roles um, will have a massive benefit to your businesses. Thanks, Kay. Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming through, and I'm keen to I'm keen to answer them. Um, as I understand, I think some, you get the most value in answering the questions that, that that you want to hear the answers for. I appreciate we're already ahead of time uh, or over time, so um, uh, Matt, Steph, uh, feel free to stop me as I start answering questions. Um, but um, I'll, I'll just sort of tackle some of these now, and then we can move on for the rest of the content. I understand we're running over, so obviously, if you need to, to, to duck off to another meeting, then please, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, so we've had a question of why aren't some recruiters, uh, including the IR35, status in roles they advertise? Um, good question. So at the moment, as we know, the decision as to whether um, the determination of the role really should sit with the contractor. Uh, the client shouldn't really technically impose their determinations um, uh, at the point of advertising a role. But as we know, that's not really reflected on what's actually going on in the market. Uh, sometimes uh, recruiters don't know. I have some sympathy here with the recruiters who advertise a role. Um, very often at the point of taking our brief, our consultants are trained to ask whether a role falls in or outside. And uh, sometimes they don't get an answer. Um, sometimes they don't get a, a clear cut or maybe it's being assessed at that time. So that's why it's sometimes not put in. Um, we are always extremely um, uh, keen here to ensure that we uh, don't get a point where we've got a contractor going through an interview process and then the determination changes or we uh, or it goes from outside to inside, which obviously makes the whole um, the whole process very challenging. So in summary, sometimes they won't know. Um, in theory, it's still the up to the contractor to determine, though I understand that's not um, uh, happening in reality. Um, and, and finally, like I said, the, um, uh, the true the state of determination can only be reached once we have all the pieces of the puzzle put together. Um, another question here is, should deliverables be tied to payment schedules uh, or can rates operate with the defined deliverable model. Um, so this was a big discussion, uh, not necessarily this time around, but certainly in the lead up to 2020 last year, uh, April 2020 last year. So the most compliant contracts um, will, will be tied to payment schedules. So uh, in, my, in my world, when things are linked to payment schedules, it falls more of a statement of work-based contract as opposed to a um, sort of a, a classic uh, PSC-led contract. But ultimately, if your deliverables are linked to uh, payments, that is a very, very compliant way of running an outside contract. However, it is perfectly possible to have an outside determination uh, with deliverables linked to, um, uh, with deliverables linked to, um, uh, sorry, you can have a perfectly uh, compliant uh, IR35 assignment with deliverables in that are kept up to date. So uh, there's no problem with that whatsoever. Um, how much of it is related to companies making cost savings? As I've seen companies initially, hang on, uh, initially saying it's inside and then weeks later saying it's outside. A really good question. So it costs around about 18% more to pay a contractor around 18% less on an inside assignment. Okay, so that's a big swing in terms of money. Um, I would really like to think that companies are not uh, putting people outside of IR35 as a, as a cost saving measure because ultimately uh, they are putting themselves as part of a risk chain and whilst in the, um, in the sequence of, of risk and liability payments, um, the person who pays the limited company contract carries the risk, there is still a chain. Um, and companies are putting themselves directly in that chain. And if they're providing, I was on a, uh, an HMRC webinar um, a week and a half ago, and they said that if companies are giving incorrect information about, their, um, about the working practice of the individual, they can still be held very much liable um, for, the, um, uh, for any fine that would be due for unpaid tax. So I'd like to think not. Um, I'd like to think that it was due to them uh, running their own internal assessments and coming out with something um, uh, that is more compliant, but 
you know, um, I'll just have to hope that's the right case, if that's okay. Um, it seems we've got a lot of questions going in now, um, which is great. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep working through these if everyone sort of agrees. Um, and, you know, we can obviously get to our last questions or, you know, I can tackle these at a later time if, if need be. So um, using your own office, your own tools, et cetera, um, to what extent are you finding clients willing to utilize these facts in their determination? So for me, um, a lot of Oliver James recruitment is in financial services and insurance. Um, and a lot of the contracts that we have on site running compliant outside IR35 contracts are using client equipment. Uh, and they're doing that because they're gonna be having access to uh, extremely sensitive data, um, customer data in some aspects, and we need to ensure that um, they're running a, a piece of equipment that is perfectly compliant. So in a very short answer to your question, the uh, use of your own tools, your own office, not being in the office is a factor but it's not a significant factor um, because ultimately some clients will dictate that you have to use their equipment for security purposes. And I think that's a, a very fair and sort of um, a compliant way of running, um, even though technically um, for a good outside determination, you'd be using your own equipment. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap up the, uh, the questions now and move on to the next section. Any more, keep them coming through. And of course, I'll tackle more uh, at the end. So what, uh, where are we up to on the questions, guys? Um, uh, uh, hey, John, it's, it's Matt. Um, unless we've covered this already, just whether we want to draw out any more in terms of the impact that IR35 will have on the availability of skills and talent, and whether we're seeing any changes already in this area. So I think the main impact on the availability of skills and talent, so the availability of skills and talent hasn't really changed um, because of IR35. It's just the access to that skill and talent that's changed. So I think the main point for me here is that there are um, there are contractors who um, will not uh, work inside of IR35. It's, you know, it's that simple. They see themselves as a true consultant and that their working practices reflect someone who works outside of IR35. If you're a company, um, that has decided to not engage with limited company contracts, which is, of course, is their own decision, and there's nothing, um, uh, nothing wrong with that at all uh, because it's being done compliantly. Um, you won't have access to those limited company contractors. So, in in not engaging um, with or with not running your assessments individually, you run the risk of of giving yourself a a smaller talent pool and, and unfortunately paying more for the talent pool that is available. Um, but that is the main impact that IR35 has had on, on skills and talent on the market. Uh, yeah, I think just to add into that, the, the, there will be, um, it's likely, you know, if we, we take some um, examples from, from what happened in the public sector and, and already what we, you know, we saw towards the um, beginning of this year, there is likely to be shifts and change, um, but we likely expect that to normalise how long that will take. You know, we haven't got a crystal ball, unfortunately, but, you know, we're confident that the um, demand for a flexible workforce will continue. Um, there is a new solution, which is inside IR35 day rate assignments. Um, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, there are more options than fixed term contracts or permanent, that there's plenty of flexible workforce options that, that clients will be considering. And certainly contractors should speak to, um, you know, their, their recruiters and, and, and their, their clients about what options they can look at. Um, but there will be evolution going into next year. Nobody has a crystal ball. Um, there may be, you know, changes in rates and availability, but um, there will, we're, we're confident and, and from speaking to clients, there will still be an appetite and a, a desire for a flexible workforce. It may just be in a slightly different um, guys. Great. Start wrapping up. Um, I think we have got a couple of questions um, for the Q&A session at the end. Um, but before we move on, um, John, if I can direct this, this to you, um, how can Oliver James help um, people prepare for IR35? Yeah, thank you, Steph. So um, I appreciate we are now uh, running over and there's still quite a few questions that I'd like to get through um, for the people on the call on the webinar. So first and foremost, um, if you are a contractor working with a business at the moment, you feel that your uh, uh, the business isn't quite ready for IR35, they're not sure what the rules are, they need some education. Um, I've run over 
sort of 100 presentations with our clients, um, going through everything from IR35 from the very basics right through to how to run an IR, a pro, uh, compliant IR35 project. So, you know, whether you are um, looking after contractors yourself or you're a contractor within the business, uh, we run a completely free presentation. Uh, I'm happy to deliver that. Um, and so if you want to uh, get us in, we can talk um, you and anybody within your business through uh, everything to do with IR35 and how we can support. So, yeah, that doesn't cost anything and, uh, and we're very happy to do it. So um, please, uh, please get in contact if that would be helpful. Uh, we can also run um, help and support with your determination. So if the uh, if you haven't done your determinations for your contractors yet, uh, we can come on and help do that. We have a number of facilities available to, to support. Where businesses uh, are struggling or have refused to engage with limited company contractors, we have a we have partnered with a um, a consulting business called Brighter Consultancy, uh, where we look to provide a true statement of work, a consulting framework, uh, whereby some companies can sign that off um, through a, a direct MSA as opposed to it being one limited company contract going in. And therefore, we can provide that as a statement of work, payment on um, sort of deliverables as we've uh, discussed previously, and running a very, very compliant um, uh, service via statement of work. And then actually, that model is quite interesting because it it takes away, um, it removes IR35 from the client and it makes uh, Brides Consultancy the uh, end engager and the fee payer, uh, which has been a very useful um, uh, proposition for some of our clients. So that's something that we can we can also run. Um, so other than practical advice, statement of work determinations, we can also provide um, inside IR35 contractors, outside IR35 contractors, we can really talk you through how to manage a contractor compliantly uh, free of charge service, um, you know, we can just help you um, work compliantly with your contingent workforce. And finally, we do have a, a managed service provision. So we have an MSP, uh, which can manage your entire contractor workforce for you and manage your entire IR35 program. Uh, that business is called Avencia uh, and can very much support any, um, any issues you may have. You want to outsource uh, your contractor, um, your contingent workforce. So those are the main services that we have and, and, and please do reach out um, if any of those are of interest to you and uh, we can talk about it in more detail. And I must say that we have a fantastically trained internal workforce of consultants. Oh, uh, good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. <laughs> absolutely agree. Um, okay. Well, I think that um, uh, not to. Uh, I've got some questions here. Would um, have I got time to go through these, Steph? Matt, what would you <laughs> do? I go on. Yeah, I think if if we could um, maybe do two or three, um, just conscious we've run over slightly. And um, what we'll say is, if we've not answered any, and um, we'll take note of them and we'll go back to everyone individually and um, post the webinar. Okay, I'll I'll try and fire through as many as I can in a an acceptable time frame. Um, so uh, someone has recently completed a contract via an umbrella company rather than limited. Um, how prevalent is this, and why do some companies use this approach? Um, so. Within any IR, uh, outside IR35 assignment uh, involving a limited company, there is a chain of liability of risk uh, that sits with, um, in the instance of Oliver James, it sits with Oliver James as the fee payer. If Oliver James don't exist and the contractor engages directly with the end client, uh, that liability then shifts to the end client. So there is a risk there. So the reason companies don't feel comfortable using um, uh, limited company contractors is simply because um, there is a risk inherent with it and when you get bigger companies with a big contingent workforce um, that risk actually becomes uh, more than their appetite to use a contractor in the first place so that's why some of them um, uh, you know are choosing not to use uh, limited company contractors um, do you find there are certain role types that favor inside versus outside um, you know I think there is um, I think it's easy to say that you know a project manager feels more outside than it does inside but uh, as I said before the reality is if um, you can run a as long as the uh, objectives of the uh, of the assignment are set and they are clear and um, it's ran compliantly with everything we've discussed before there's nothing about the type of role that you do that leads to an inside or outside determination. Will Oliver James be working with clients to redraft contracts so that any existing or new interim consultants can work outside of IR35. Um, so yes, in some, some instances, we will be redrafting contracts. Um, some of our clients are redrafting their contracts. Uh, it's really important that we look at our contract um, with 
with the limited company and our contract with the end client. Those things have got to, to match and mirror uh, to ensure that the upper and lower level agreements match. And if they do, um, and we're happy with the determination evidence on it, there's no reason why someone can't work uh, compliantly outside of IR35. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, I can keep going on these, but I think there's uh, uh, people are starting to drop off now. I've probably heard enough of my voice. Um, I will um, be delighted to answer any questions. Um, look me up on LinkedIn, drop me a note. Um, if you want to talk about any of these things in more detail, I'd be happy to have a chat with you. Um, and I'm sorry we've run out of time, and I'm sorry that we've run on uh, uh, too far. That's great. Thank you so much um, there, John, and also Kay. Um, so that concludes today's webinar. Um, apologies again for running slightly over, um, but we hope you have found the content interesting and useful. Um, so thank you to Kay and John um, for presenting, obviously, on today's webinar, and thank you to everyone who has joined us. Um, like I said before, if we've been un unable to answer any of your questions during the session, feel free to, to message Kay, message um, John, or to drop uh, myself an email um, and we'll come back to you individually with, with an answer. Um, so over the next couple of days, um, please keep an eye out on our LinkedIn page for a direct link to today's recording. Um, that's it from me. Thanks again for tuning in and we hope to see you again very soon.